Good morning or good evening. I'm Gillian Knipe and this is the closing episode of Art Fiction's Series 1 as we slowly begin to tiptoe back to life outside our homes. For me, that means studio visits, but for how long? Today's guest is the very talented Alice Brown, who I actually interviewed before lockdown. I wanted to finish this series on a high note in the hope that post-lockdown life is not only possible, but includes changes for the better. Let's see how that works out. Anyway, I first saw Alice's work in a tiny gallery in Hackney called Limoncello years ago. She is first and foremost a painter, not quite abstract, not quite figurative. In fact, perhaps these categories are not quite useful. I think of Alice's work as partly like an investigation of perception and partly like a floating collection of shapes, shadows, everyday objects, patterns and even body parts, like hands, which seem to point the way, though I'm never quite sure where to. There's as much speculation in her paintings as there is playfulness, and it's as if she's inviting us to wander around the surface of the canvas and discover what's there. Then we can make our own connections and create our own stories. As an artist whose practice is underpinned by the notion that our experience is a mixture of reality and fantasy, it's no surprise that Alice has chosen a children's storybook, which brings together the boy and the stuff of his dreams. Seawater and the Dragon was written by Luciana Chetwind and the Chetwind children. Here's a quick synopsis. Naughty little Seawater climbs the mountain above his village to discover a depressed dragon and a cave of nightmarish beasts. His dad, the stonemason, is instructed by the mayor to create a suite of gargoyles, so Seawater convinces him to use the collection of monsters seeing as they sleep during the day anyway, so they're bound to stay still on their allotted plinths. During the unveiling of the sculptures, the dragon is furious with the villagers, who won't eat the extravagant cake which he helped make. He explodes into fireworks. Everyone is incredibly impressed. He goes on to become a huge tourist attraction, while seawater becomes the town's hero. Alice Brown, it's lovely to be in your studio again. I must admit, it's not as exciting as last time. Because last time <laughs> you had lots of paintings around getting ready yeah. for your show at Tintype Gallery. But still, it's it's the right atmosphere to discuss your work. And it's I'd the like... ebb and flow of the of the studio. It's a natural process. It all comes all comes in and all leaves again. So let's start with why did you choose this book? I chose that book because. Uh, for a couple of reasons, really. For for me, it's obviously quite natural to put words and images together. So I was quite keen on the idea of picking a book that had uh, an illustration side to it. Obviously, I, I do, you know, I read a lot of adult fiction books and things, but to just talk about that in front of an audience with you and to have something to have a dialogue with in quite an easily accessible way, I kind of, I feel like children's stories can have just as much complexity you know, as, as anything else. So I wanted to pick something that felt quite natural. And children's books for me have that strong connection because you've known them for a really long time. I recently thought of that book when I was looking for a title for a painting because of the illustrations in it and because of the way that the story goes. I just had this inkling of going back to look at that story, revisit it and see if there was anything in the text which inspired me to title one of the works. And it, it didn't in the end, but... When you asked me to pick a book, I was just like, well, that's that's the natural choice because I'd already been drawn to it anyway. And I hadn't looked at it for many years, but it's a book that I kept hold of. You know, not all of the, the books that you grow up with stay with you, but this was one that definitely did. And can you remember reading it? And when you were a child, do you know how long you had it for? Was it a book you read to yourself? I mean, or? it wasn't a book that was purchased for me. Uh, I think it was probably gotten hold of by one of my parents for my older brothers because it was written in the 70s and I imagine that they were probably quite drawn to the illustrations in it as much as I was and I don't really remember reading the book because I I perhaps was looking at it at a time when I wasn't able to read it but in you know in small sections I do recall the you know, the way that the story goes but I vividly remember looking at the illustrations and it's quite nice of the way that the book is written. It has some important words in capital letters. So it really draws your attention to the important stuff, even if your attention span isn't great enough for the amount of text that's in there. And I always remember being quite drawn to the name Seawater. 
So there's so much in the text that we'll get onto, but just staying with the illustrations, because Mm. that was your first attraction, they've got a looseness, a sort of wonkiness. Mm. It's almost Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in so far as nothing feels quite balanced. Uh, There are contradictory perspectives, something that should be far away and therefore smaller. Part of it seems smaller, but then the character, like for instance, Seawater, is too large and so you get this contradiction that's really interesting there's lots going on nothing's very certain and I saw that as such a direct connection with the way you approach your work yeah and I think that's that's really important to note that things that feel really large and put aside things that don't feel so large because that's how we you know that's how we experience landscape that's how we experience big things like mountains uh and the things that are tackled in the book you know dragons mountainsides, caves and enormous uh, cakes. These are all things which are quite hard to put into one, you know, A4 size illustration. But to put them side by side, but still be able to feel the enormity of those things is quite impressive. And that's that's how painting has worked for, for many years before perspective, really. You don't need to put in a real perspective or a sense of perspective in order to actually feel how big things can be. Our brain can figure it out. You know, but our brains are always adjusting. It's like that strange thing when you go to take a picture of uh, of the landscape, which feels so close, but you're aware of how big it is, but it feels close and close enough to photograph or the huge super moon that you can see. And then you get your camera out and it transposes it into this tiny thing and makes you aware of how far away it actually is. Uh, so in a way, the illustrations help to bring forward a lot of that stuff, which our brain would do that visually if we were there standing in front of it. And the what you just said about the kind of the way that the illustration is done, you know, it's always moving, it's always shifting. There's lots of scratchy lines and it's kind of agitated and there's nothing particularly straight. You know, there aren't any very straight edges. It's everything's everything's in movement, everything's shifting. And I really enjoy that because that's something that I feel exists a lot in rocky landscape. And I enjoy going to the mountains and, and sensing that. You know, things haven't been cut by human hand. Things haven't been formed. They don't exist in frames and, uh, you know, on a, an iPad screen or what have you. It's, uh, it, it's all moving all the time. And you've said before that you don't like straight lines. Yeah, for multiple reasons, partly because I'm really bad at, at producing them. But also, yeah, because it just it doesn't feel very natural because obviously the straight line of a canvas or piece of paper is already it's a gift. It's already given to you. And I like to sometimes mimic that by hand, knowing that I'll never achieve the same thing. But I've always reacted against that, I suppose, in the way that I have made shapes and forms within my paintings, you know, since I first became an artist, partly because, as I say, I'm very aware of the, the movement of our heads and the movements of our eyes and the the weird peripheral things that happen to your vision. And wearing glasses has always been a reminder of that, even just noticing that you can see your glasses frames in the corner of your eye at all times you know it's there you can't quite focus on it but though those little things that are always always moving it feels quite natural to me therefore to paint in a way that allows for that movement and for viewers to feel like they're experiencing something that has a little bit of accessibility and you know not being too static that isn't to say that I don't occasionally refer to more static lines and try to make something that feels more graphic or architectural But if anyone were to make a building set to my designs, it probably wouldn't be very stable. (laughs) There's also, coming back to that idea of perspective, which you were talking about before, there's a visual perspective. uh, And as you say, I also wear glasses. So there is the vision I have with my glasses on. And then there's the vision I have without my glasses on. And sometimes, oddly, when things are out of focus... I understand more, for instance, when I'm looking at a painting, I will often look at it with my glasses on Mm. and then take my glasses off and it's all fuzzy. But with the fuzziness, I can understand the structure of the painting more, the balance, how the composition is leaning to one side or quite restful, which I can't necessarily see with my glasses on. That's interesting. Yeah. And that sort of brings me to another perspective, which is not just a a physical, mechanical perspective, but also the perspective that memory imbues into our vision. And, And that comes back to what you were saying before about some things looming large because they're important, 
even though they might be far away yeah. and technically would otherwise be smaller and therefore in the distance. Whereas you, in your paintings, you will have these floating objects. Some of them are three-dimensional. Uh, some of them are like flat planes. Mm. Some of them point towards something that otherwise would be three-dimensional, but it appears as a flat piece. I'm thinking specifically of the broken plate in your painting. Oh, after the last word slash Vindolanda. Yeah, and your husband was actually saying, oh, I can remember when that plate broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was pleased to see it appear in the painting. That sort of, you know, some some objects are floating, some objects are grounded. And when you were talking about vision before, I was thinking about cubism and the way that the image is all chopped up. And whereas I feel you've got some of that, but it's all, it's almost like it's, it's set free. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting what you said before about taking off your glasses and having, having access to that very private thing, which is your own personal way of seeing, which people don't necessarily feel so aware of if they don't have uh, a a visual (laughs) impediment, but uh, you know, it, I also have that when I take my glasses off. I feel like this is just for me. This is only the way that I see the world. It's not necessarily the true way of seeing the world because I don't think such a thing exists. But, you know, this is something which is personal to me and I can choose to remove the detail from from what I'm looking at if I wish to. And it it makes you aware that the detail can be very distracting. And all those little signifiers that are contained within all the images that you see you know it takes your brain off into lots of places and in making the paintings I think there definitely is a sense of removing some of the some or being aware of of the fact that that space that I make is particular to me and I have control to make that space and I that's the space that I love which is you know one of complete potential where things aren't particularly defined but you might feel like something could appear and it's this space which doesn't necessarily have a gravitational field it doesn't exist on a tabletop but I mean sometimes I like to play with a little bit of you know feeling of still life some things do come to rest on tabletops and have shadows and have weight but the the space itself the background space is allowed to be a bit more free for and I'm actually toying with the idea at the moment of making some works which are sort of more in a particular space, like a real feeling space. And I'm a little bit frightened of trying to do that because it feels like I'm shutting down some of that possibility. It's like walking around. We're not always seeing the floor. You don't you don't have a sense of surface. You're not staring at your feet the whole time. You know, you're looking up and the things that you're seeing just kind of appear you don't necessarily see the base of the building, you see the top of it, but you know it's not floating. But the possibility that it could be, you know, if you believed exactly what your eyes were seeing and took away the rest of your uh, knowledge of the world. So approaching the empty canvas space is a bit like a bit like that. It's the freedom to, to reimagine spaces and what, what the laws could be and what physics could do. Absolutely. Yeah. So the you're saying that this idea of you potentially possibly doing paintings in a, a recognisable space and talking about still life as well reminds me you are quite keen on the Dutch still lifes. Yeah, I mean, I was quite into the, the Vanitas style of still life painting when I was you know, about 16, 17 and I was first made, making terrible paintings. But I, yeah, I really enjoyed just looking into that and, and seeing that Yes, it was, you know, they were incredibly made paintings in terms of their representation, but that wasn't that wasn't all they were. And in fact, they were quite ugly and awkward often, you know, these strange challenges that the painters had set for themselves, things sitting on the edges of tabletops and goblets half full, um skulls, dead objects. That, you know, why why would you bring this really awkward assortment of things together unless you were trying to say something else? And that was quite interesting to me. So coming back to the illustrations, the aside from perspective, the other aspect of them is their incredibly vibrant colours. And uh, Luciana Chetwin, who drew all the illustrations herself, has put together some banging colours that really play off one another. Mm. And that has me thinking about the colours in your paintings. You're clearly not afraid of colour. Mm. And yet sometimes you use black and white. Sometimes you use just variations of one color. Blue paintings, for instance, yeah, have, have sure, reoccurred, yeah. reoccurred a couple of times and you've gone from vibrant pinks and oranges to browns 
back to pinks and reds. Do you want to talk a little bit about the colours and your decision making? I suppose, again, part of the reason that this book appeals to me and the illustrations always have appealed to me is because it is so vibrant. You know, the the dragon has rainbow wings. Now, I know the story and the ideas behind a lot of the illustrations and everything were all fed into by uh, Luciana's children. So, you know, there's a lot of imagination in there and a joyful access to colour. And that's something which I find always appeals to me when I'm making work. I want to just go and grab the the lovely hot pinks and the translucent azure blues. And, you know, I want to have it all a bit like giving in to your guilty desires. And, you know, sometimes it can be a bit of a dog's dinner and I have to try and rein it in, uh, which is why sometimes I, I find it easier to restrict or challenge myself to pick just a couple of colours or to, to maybe just try one colour and work with tonal ranges. And the black and white thing, of course, then it really makes you focus on the sort of graphic elements of the work. It makes me think more about line, more about the subtleties in the texture of the paint, because of course, you know, the surface of a painting is not all about the colour alone, but about the texture of each colour, because each colour has its own, uh, you know, inherent transparency, glossiness, and you can play with those things rather than just creating contrast through putting yellow next to blue, for example. But sometimes when you're looking for a quick hit, then yeah, that's what you'll go to. You know, you go for the bright contrast. And here in this book that's designed for children, there's sections at the end of the book which tend towards this incredible party. And she manages to build this opulent feeling into it, which is quite sickening. And I'm really curious to know where that came from. You know, if that was her idea, if it was the children's idea. Who who is it amongst them that decided that all the people of the village were so gluttonous that they were like pigs yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they got to they got to have all the food they wanted in this great celebration and then they were too you know too full to eat the cake everything that's held up in that is just it's this wonderful sickness through excess which i mean i know the book was written in the 70s but it feels very uh feels very timely absolutely and timeless probably yeah yeah the uh, other thing about the colours was uh, I was looking on your shelves before and there was a pigment uh, called something or other Violet Hell. Well, that's funny, actually, because that's I think that the colour you picked up is cobalt violet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though it has the German on it. Even though it has a very wonderful, vibrant look to it, it's very transparent. So if you were using that colour, let's just talk about that colour for a moment, as a semi-translucent, would you build that up? Do you mean building up layers of colour like yeah. one over the other? Yeah. It's something I kind of go go to at times, but more often than not, because I, especially a colour like cobalt violet, it's such an expensive pigment. If I'm going to pick that colour up, I really want that colour to be seen. But building up colour through layers is something which happens almost incidentally rather than being planned. I used to spend a lot of time mixing colours, but now I do tend to find that actually I just I enjoy working with the colour as it is where possible. If I can make a painting that feels a little bit fresher, then I, I that's sort of how that's where I tend towards. I quite enjoy the the feeling that the surface hasn't uh, hasn't been laboured over excessively. I can't really afford to waste paint as well. <laughs> so. Well, there is that. In fact, I've got a friend who uh, works with a lot of inks. Her attitude is that the manufacturers go to such effort to create all these different colorways. Yeah. I'm just going to go with that because then I don't waste materials. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I try, they're expensive. I mean, I love mixing colors. I do, but I always end up making too much paint. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. throwing paint away is is an awful thing to have to do, so... And there's only, only so many cart door ice cream tubs that you can put them in. <laughs> that's, that's a very good point, yes. Yeah. So it's not just the colours that, of course, are the critical thing in the book. There's also what the illustrations are of. So rocks, earth formations, mountains, caves. I find in all this, there's an idea that begins in the book. I mean, this is my reading of it. Mm where everything is sort of in its right place. And, of course, its right place, like the Radiohead song, is is in inverted commas because everything then shifts around. So, for instance, Seawater and his family live under the mountain. They're kind of like outsiders in a way or people 
on the rim of things, mm. uh, on the edge of things. And it's very easy then to think about, does everything really have its right place? Who Who is it that makes something right and something wrong or something right yeah. versus something rightful? Yeah. We've talked about that in the context of the work that you did in your solo exhibition, Found, Mm -hmm. where you were doing a lot of work that was around caves and we'd both read Dante's Inferno and we were talking about the idea of underground and the idea of mystery. You talked about so many aspects of caves at a sort of conceptual level, if you like, or philosophical level down to visiting caves as a kid. Yeah. And do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because it, it, it's it's interesting, of course. That and also you're a rock climber. Of course. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, in, in the in the story, the mountain is a scary place, which I find quite odd. Uh, I mean, I can kind of understand why, but, you know, everyone's afraid of the mountain in the story. And, you know, usually it's the underground spaces, which you'd think people would be afraid of. But uh, the mountain obviously comes with its risks and the adults in the story are trying to prevent the children from going up there. So they say there's monsters up there. So yeah, I kind of, I find that interesting, that inherent fear we have of particular places. And it's generally to do with that sense of the unknown or a place that wasn't created for humans, which is partly the excitement of going to visit those places. So natural cave sites, you know, that have been hollowed out by water, mountains, they weren't designed for us. We make it work. We find a way to get up and into the mountains to use those spaces. But you're very much aware that there's no allowances made for us, you know, when the weather takes its toll, it hits the mountains first. It's it's those kind of spaces which make you more aware, perhaps, of the power that the Earth still has over us. Right now, across the globe, things are changing way out of control. And uh, it's just a little reminder sometimes that there are things in place which are ebbing and flowing, changing all the time, which we don't really have a full sense of. But the stories that are created around them... That mythology, you know, when you talk about Dante, it's still that feeling of putting something almost religious to the journey of exploring these places. Or, yeah, the the fear of the unknown, the dark things that could be taking place underground in these spaces. These are all man's creations, you know, and it's the stuff of stories, but it's such a long running story. There's no time, you know, where a dark space has not been a fearful place for a human because our eyesight is so important to us, you know, mm. to, to be in a place where you're slightly out of control. So, you know, I, I like that fear, but excitement that meets in those places. And then when you think about going to visit a cave as a tourist, which, you know, I've done a few times and the catalyst for making the works in that exhibition um, found at Tintype was a visit to a particular cave in Mallorca a couple of years ago, which was one of those caves that had been uh, opened up to the public quite soon after its discovery to make money. And it was not very well done, but, you know, they'd had to construct all these awkward concrete passageways and uh, they'd lit up particular places which they thought were more exciting. And there was a small gift shop in the exit. And, uh, (laughs) you know, the whole experience is very different to what you might have imagined. They talked about the the experience of the people who first discovered the cave. And, you know, it's strange that the feeling that they had, it's not, oh my gosh, look at this, you know, amazing thing. And, And... What do I feel? What do I experience? But I've found this thing. It belongs to us. How can we make money out of it? Which is peculiar, but that's just, it's the natural way that we, that we treat them. That it's we treat really, these places now. Yeah, yeah. It's, re- it's really bizarre. Although some of them are now being closed down, thank goodness. Yeah, and preserved, of course, yeah. But I remember you saying that uh, you had visited caves as a child where you get that illumination of things that are supposedly interesting but they're yeah. also illuminated with false colored lights yes yeah and so you had told me that you thought those lights were the real color of the caves yeah. and that and that came out in one of your paintings mighty connect discovery spaghetti yeah. factory mm-hmm I thought that was quite funny because the painting itself has these l- luminous yeah. greens and <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I didn't really understand anything different. You know, they hide the lights from you. So I just thought what I was seeing was all part of this natural spectacle. <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it was incredible. I mean, it was like looking at an illustration. It was beautiful. And uh, I absolutely loved those places. 
Um, and of course, it would be completely different if it, if it weren't all lit up and colored in that way. But, you know, I've also learned since then about the some of the colors that are on the rocks, you know, have been added over time because bacteria has fed various life forms, algae and things that are growing down there, which in themselves do create quite interesting colors. It's, yeah, it's kind of a man-made form of painting down there, I guess. That's uh, very different from, obviously, the ancient cave painting. But uh... So the ancient cave paintings... That brings me on to this idea of revisiting assumptions in history, which there seems to be a lot of that going on in art at the moment and in books, of course, of re-looking and rediscovering and reinventing ideas of, of history. And one of the stories of cave paintings, for instance, and of the original works of art, Mm. if you like, that arguably we have or have not uh, improved upon, (laughs) not at all, according (laughs) to Picasso, is that all the hand prints are probably done by women and children. And I really like that idea that there's something about the origins of art that are non-gendered, you know, that everybody is involved in. Yeah. That I I really genuinely find that very moving. Mm. And and that sort of, you know, that connection that we want to have to people who existed before the rules that we know now. But it often comes back down to the trying to get a sense of intention because there's still a bit of uncertainty over sort of the purpose of the paintings. You know, were they made for, for the pleasure of making art or were they made as part of some sort of symbolic, you know, semi spiritual act? Or perhaps a communication system that we yeah. don't know about. And, and you know, we, we're, we're never going to know. And that's Ooh, I part, part of the intrigue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we find anybody who was there at the time. Time travel, not yes. yet been invented, but you never know. Not quite. I was talking before about the idea of things being in their right or rightful place. And that reminded me of taking things from one situation and putting them in another situation. So for instance, you work with fragments of Mother of Pearl, slate, there's lots of different materials that can go into a painting. Mm. So can you talk about why you're introducing the actual material into a painting? Because I was making work that was partly thinking about this problem of ownership and, you know, what what it is to go and take something from the ground and make it yours. Taking natural resources, let's say, and making them fit to our purposes, monetizing them. And so in a slightly openly hypocritical way, I wanted to use some of those natural resources in the paintings and, and do it in a very open way. It's difficult to stop and think, like, where does the paint come from? You know, where do the colours come from? Where is this stuff? And, and when you really think about the ground that it's been dug up from and who does that, you know, who's working in those places to dig up the ochres and uh, for some of the colours, you know, working in laboratories with certain chemicals, you know, who's who's putting this stuff together? We're quite disconnected. I mean, we don't have to be. Yes, I could go up and go out and dig up my own pigments, but... You know, when you do think about it in an extensive way and expand that onto so many other things like, uh, you know, food sources. And it's just it's very interesting to think of the origins of stuff. And and with paintings, you know, you can feel quite close to some of those, uh, especially, you know, with more gritty pigments. The slate pigment, for example, I've always loved for that because, you know, you do have a strong sense of it. Mica is great because it has that glitteriness that reminds me of walking in the mountains and what you might see in the ground you know mother of pearl you instantly reminded of being on a beach i haven't but i could i suppose just go and take some sand and bring that into the painting so yeah it's just kind of a reminder that stuff has traveled to to be here it's so easy at hand but like where has it really come from and that's something that which we're all perhaps hopefully trying to be a little bit more responsible and thinking about more aware of in the future because it's you know it's become very natural to to feel very disconnected from those things and you know paintings are a really weird combination of stuff plastics and oils and you know they're perhaps not the most sustainable <laughs> things no. really mm. as an artist you're opening up those questions aren't you yeah um, there's a lovely story, Socrates Lived, by which was about this idea of ignorance. If you live in ignorance, everything is about humility, curiosity. You problematize everything. And when we look at seawater and his family, you know, his, his dad has spent time in jail and he's known as the sort of town mischief. 
And he's the one that dares to journey up the mountain. He's the one who has the ability to see the monster. and Who isn't really a monster. That's right. (laughs) And the monster for what he is. The monster's depressed. It's lonely. It's got this hunger for lovely sweetness. Yeah, it doesn't eat children. Doesn't eat children at all. And you think, well, in in some way, you as the artist, like seawater and like Socrates, the philosopher, you know, you're the one to problematize. You're the one to use slate in your paintings as a way of saying, should we be doing this? What, what are we doing when we are doing this, when we are taking these elements of the earth and using them for our own production? Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I would never choose to create work which has some kind of agenda in that way. Mm. But yeah, to create discussion around it certainly is my way into it. Artists, we're very material creatures. A lot of the time we like to make stuff. You know, we like to have our hands on things. And, you know, we actually are quite far away from having our hands on the, the real raw materials. But we feel like we're, we're getting, you know, our hands dirty. But here we are in our white painted studios and we're actually quite far from it. You know, and here I am with this little stack of books next to me. If I wanted to be more responsible, maybe I would have them all on an electronic device. I wouldn't be reading these uh, bits of pulped up trees. But, you know, I love the feel and the weight of of a book. And I like knowing kind of how far I am through it and being able to flick through the pages and having a sense of the the real weight of things for example is something you just become more aware of when you're working with dry pigments instead of just working with uh, ready-made paint. So moving on to your exhibition that you had in Amsterdam, which was called Camouflage, I was thinking about that in terms of the symbols that you were talking about. So for instance, towards the end of the book, there's this buildup of all this colour, so much colour that it becomes unpalatable in the same way that the characters in the book overstuff themselves with consumption. Yeah. There are always symbols going on in your paintings. But I felt, rightly or wrongly, there was a lot more in the works that you had in camouflage. You've got the yin yang Mm. chains, bent nails, broken plates. In some of your paintings, there's those lovely single trainers. Shells, gems, candles, heart, clock face, hands, toes. (laughs) Where does it all end? What does it all mean? (laughs) (laughs) I suppose it's kind of a shorthand way of connecting to a a group of ideas that maybe I've been having around the time of making the work. And obviously we were talking earlier about um, still life painting. That's a very natural way that I came to be interested in using symbolic forms within painting. But also I'm very aware that in daily life we use symbols as a shorthand of expressing how we feel or what we're thinking about something all the time, even just through using emojis on our phone. So quite often when I use a symbol in a painting, it's sometimes it's kind of, you know, there and it's a little bit incongruous, almost like a like a button. I made this painting for the exhibition, which is called DPM, and I inserted quite early on into it this kind of floating scales. Yeah. Uh, yeah. which is in a square. And that for me it sort of directly related to going through and picking a symbol on my phone because you know it's the kind of thing I hadn't realized at the time when I was making the work but then I went through and I realized oh yeah there is there is a symbol for for scales I suppose a shorthand for lots of things for the legal system and for equality and fairness and you know all those things that we connect to it it's a it's a very easy shorthand to point at so many different things but in particular for that exhibition the symbols had a, a greater a broader sense because I was looking at how we adorn ourselves with symbols as well. And not just ourselves, but the homes we live in through pattern. And patterns, of course, are also a kind of symbol for, you know, we talk about chains, you know, things things like eternity and uh, longevity and um, strength and bond and, you know, lots of things which we don't necessarily think about. But even, you know, in a simple form, like a um, piece of twisted wood, or the symbol of a of a wedding ring, you know, something long lasting. The yin yang came up time and time again in these works because I was, oh, that's my mug. I was thinking about, um, you know, how I would use that symbol when I was a teenager, and I would wear it because I, for me, it, you know, it had one set of connections. But it mainly I was just wearing it because it was popular, and I thought it was trendy, and I thought it was, you know, I thought it was <laughs> symbolic of this kind of. A uh, free spirited, meditative person that I wanted to be, and right on, peace, brother. Yeah, yeah. But now when I look at it, it it actually doesn't feel like that for me. It feels quite, 
you know, it feels like it's really symbolizing opposition. And I know that there's a, there's a lot mm. of readings of mm. the yin yang, of course, but in a very simple term to create these oppositions like light and dark and masculine mm. and feminine, you know, I find that quite unhelpful. Yeah. Same. Now. So, yeah, I was using these symbols in a sort of provocative way, but kind of adorning the paintings, like dressing them up to see if they wore these symbols, you know, how would they be read and would could I kind of disguise them to be these illustrations or symbolic forms that were trying to hope for their own personal success and longevity and uh, harmonious nature, you know, within the gallery space by using these forms. I mean, it was kind of, you know, a bit of a, a dry sentiment. That was my, my hope mm, anyway. Mm. And I took all that as a, as a form of camouflage in the way that we choose to change how we present those beliefs to the world, you know, what, what we're thinking inside through our choice of symbol and clothing and the way we dress our houses as a way of disguising what we might really feel or a way of fitting into our surroundings. And yeah, so that, you know, the camouflage element helped me to kind of hide some of these symbols a little, <laughs> a little bit. And yeah, they became yeah. these incredibly busy paintings. And uh, yeah, that kind of feeling of crescendo and like you, you've got to really get into the work to to find your own way and it's really interesting what you said about the book and the, and the you know the white space disappearing because that's kind of how it feels when you're making a painting you know you're suddenly painting out all the white space it's like you're losing connection with the room you're in when you do that you know when you're looking at the book for example and you're like, seeing all this color and this tiny amount of text you know you're really in there and you've got to decide what you're going to choose to look at there's almost too much information to take in all at once and I, that's how i quite enjoy presenting paintings i mean th th mm. at least that that set of paintings that i made for the show at flatland gallery were all made to be a little bit overwhelming yeah which is the way we consume images at the moment is very much like that i was also thinking about the symbols like language are a way of simplifying, of closing down. There's a, an idea that part of our problem or part of our narrowness in the way we interpret or perceive is through language itself. And I would say that symbols do that much more because they are so simple. But then there are so many emojis that really do, I feel, sum up exactly how <laughs> what I <laughs> yeah. want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In fact, I'm quite happy for them to replace words sometimes. But also as soon as we start naming things, then we close down possibilities. We close down potentials. Mm. There's a lovely quote by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which I can't remember the actual quote, but he was talking about the world being so new that we didn't have names for things and we could only indicate what we were talking about by pointing at it. Yeah. And now we have names for things and that can really reduce things as well. And it's getting a bit esoteric, but I, I'm thinking quite specifically about things like measurements and weights. There is a part of the world that still exists. Actually, there are many parts of the world that still exist that are not measured. Mm. But, but it's natural to us to do so. You know, Absolutely. To be able, because we need to be able to talk about it in order to share it. Because we have a part of our brain that is specifically a need for communication. So yeah, and for quantifying. Yeah. But the, the, the what I find very interesting, and I think perhaps partly why reading what other people have written, reading fiction uh, is so significant for me is because it allows me to be in a space in my, you know, be in a mental space of imagination that I cannot describe, I cannot quantify, I can't communicate that to anybody else. You know, when you, you see somebody and you, you, you've been to see a film and the film is based on a book and it's like, oh, you know, what did you think? Uh, how did it, you know, how did it sit for you in comparison to your reading of the book? What they really mean is, how does it fit with your vision of, of the story that you read? And it's really hard to say. And, you know, and sometimes we fear that it's going to overwrite our original feeling, our original ideas of how the, the book looked, how those characters acted. Very often, the way they look is not specific. It's a feeling you have about the characters. It doesn't need to be specific because you don't need to say it out loud or draw them. But we have a, you know, a strong flair now for creating visual representations of fiction. Yeah, it's challenging. But there's still spaces that we own completely that we cannot describe. Like whatever you've dreamt about, you know, you try and describe that to somebody else and it mm. never works. And it's often boring for somebody Absolutely. else. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds ridiculous and, and actually quite banal, but 
you have a this vivid sense of it that you cannot recall adequately with words. And I love that. And and the thing for me about reading books, especially long books, you know, I have a bit of a tendency towards traveling sagas, is that you are in it for quite a long time. It lives alongside you. You know, maybe if I'm reading slowly, you know, maybe I'll read it over the course of six months. And it's intertwined with my existence, my experience of real life during that time. But in a in a sense, that's what I try and draw on when I'm making artworks, because they also take place over a period of time. And over that period of time, you've experienced lots of different things. So you can try to kind of bring elements of it in to the painting while you're working. And I, I imagine perhaps that's how it is for writers. I mean, I've never written a book. I'd love to be able to, but you know, I don't think it's it's in me. But bringing things in over a space of time. It's a very unusual, personal, private space, as you say, because it's uncommunicable. And I don't think we will ever develop a way of communicating that to one another. We do our very best with the language that we've got. But some things, some some feelings and visions that we've had are just beyond that. So speaking of dreams and nightmares, which are located in the book, we start with everything being in its rightful place. Well, where we would assume is its rightful place. But then as the book progresses... Seawater becomes involved more with the village. Uh, His dad becomes more involved with the village. In fact, his dad has to create these statues. And then the monsters come down from the mountain and they become involved in the village. So there's this crossover where everything ends up being within the village. Everything's enmeshed. Mm. And I was thinking of that not just in your paintings and the way that you put all these ideas into your paintings and objects into your paintings over a period of time. And that probably contributes to their liveliness because you're, mm. you're responding to what's happening now. But there's also this idea of art amongst the people and rightfulness and access to art. Yeah. And I suppose I have found art at times in my life quite life-saving. And I, d- I didn't grow up in a you know, an art family or anything, Mm. but I I can pinpoint moments where I've almost accidentally stumbled across art and it's had a really profound effect on me, but in an ordinary life kind of way. I suppose there's something about this podcast that's very much about wanting to sort of open up art in some sort of way and have people be able to access that, you know, I I don't want it to be like a separate world uh, yeah, you know, I don't. I don't want it to be the monster in the mountain. Mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I do not make the work just for me. Yeah, it's it's never been it's never been that for me really. I don't have a compulsion. I don't have a yeah a spiritual need. I I enjoy making the works because they're an appropriate way for me to convey you know thoughts that I have and to make connections and. I want to be able to share that with people, absolutely. And yeah, it's it's very important to get the work out there when you can. And and if you can be a fly on the wall and hear how people connect to the work, that's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Most mm-hmm. of the time, anyway. Mm-hmm. Because they don't necessarily get from it what you put into it, of course, in the same way that you read a book and I read a book and we'll read it differently. You're, you're offering something up to be looked at and interpreted and other people's experiences of the symbols that I've put into the work will be different to my own. And it's a way of creating a dialogue, a connection, but absolutely this, this immediacy of color and materiality is just something that you don't get in other parts of your life necessarily. And of course I, you know, experienced art at quite a young age. I was very lucky to be taken to some art galleries by my dad and, you know, to go and see painting and just, be there in this really odd activity, in fact, and just stand in front of a work and, and look at not only at what it's depicting, but how it was made and, and to think of, you know, the how the marks were made. And th- it's just it's a very it's a very unusual experience from our day to day existence. And it doesn't have a particular purpose. You don't have to do anything with it. It's just something that you exist in the same space with for a while. And, and perhaps you think about it, you know, for the next day the next week or if you're really lucky you know for the next decade or (laughs) or or indeed a lifetime exactly yeah Yeah. there are lots of 
institutions in the UK and galleries and project spaces that are doing a lot of work to open up access to art. The flip side of that is that we see in the book the dragon's fury at the fact that the cake wasn't eaten Mm. where he explodes and it's seen as a fireworks show you know his fury is reduced to entertainment seawater and the dragon end up as a tourist attraction and how can art be maintain its integrity and not not be just seen as entertainment, be something that people can take away with them in their minds. When I can, I add to my Instagram post, for instance, something that I can see as a result of the exhibition that I've just been to. Mm. And and I quite like that. And it's that that thing of, you know, life imitating art, you know, as opposed to art imitating life, where art has this amazing way to open up to us open up the world, open up our vision to us so that we can see more in the way that, you know, if you read about philosophy or science or psychoanalysis, that they are also other ways uh, Mm -hmm. to see more and to understand more. I obviously think it's wonderful if you can have access to art regularly. Obviously, we're very fortunate that we live in London and we do have enough spaces operating here which are run by artists so aren't just uh you know commercial ventures or we're very very lucky they're commercial ventures who are willing to support artists who don't produce such readily sellable work it's incredible how much you can see in an afternoon we have open studios you can go around and see work in progress it's very difficult to know how to expand that into other places Uh, I was actually talking with a friend the other day about this idea about putting on very small exhibitions in rural locations I absolutely love getting outside of the city and doing other things, but I I very rarely take my art with me and I don't often make art while I'm there. And there's a very different experience in those places because you're not surrounded by the the art machine, you know, the art world running its course. And, you know, I hope and I think that that's kind of that is changing. But people experience it in their own ways. And seeing art online is obviously a fantastic way of having access we know mm. we know it's not the same, obviously, mm. but you know people do get in contact from all over the world who might have stumbled across your work online, uh, and showing your work on Instagram with an audience, you know, which is so vast, is is a wonderful thing to be able to do. When I put an exhibition on, I know there's only going to be a handful of people really who are going to see it in, in comparison to the people that will see it online. But you know, it's still a very important thing to do. But just to have access to those ideas in the first place mm, and uh, mm. to be involved with a with a dialogue and, a you know, have a connection to a group of people and know that you can get in contact, I think, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously, you're an yeah. artist as well. So you have a confidence to know that artists generally <laughs> are quite open and friendly people. Yeah, yeah. So if you drop someone a line or if you, you know, go to their open studio and say hello, you know, you're going to be able to start an interesting conversation. Mm. So it takes a bit of... Uh, takes a bit of confidence to to not see the artists the makers as these you know unknown entities slightly scary slightly confusing or maybe closed people you know we do want to talk about what we what we make yeah we're not we're not dangerous dragons we're the with are with a nice kind with rainbow wings absolutely and we're also not just making art all the time we're also reading so alice yeah. brown can you tell me what uh what else are you reading at the moment So at the moment I'm reading uh, Earthsea, which is um, the beginning of a epic fantasy fiction book by Ursula K. Le Guin. And she is better known, I think, for her sci-fi works. Okay. I haven't Um, read her. Yeah. um, yeah, I've read a couple of those, but I actually, I I love epic fantasy, basically. Uh, I'm only a little way in about a third of the way through but uh you know can I just say at, at the moment we're, we're we're sitting in Alice's studio and she actually has a pile of about not quite 10 books we're not going to go through them all though no no we? no I promise <laughs> <laughs> no they're just little visual reminders to me for things you know important things yeah um, she, re- she reads trust me yeah but I mean I read <laughs> slowly that's the thing you know I, I like to to take it in but uh, I, I always wish I could read more you know, I wish that I, I wish I had more lifetimes to, to read in, of course. Yeah, I couldn't but, agree more. But yeah, this book so far, you know, it has wizards, it has nightmarish shadows, it has uh, underground labyrinths, it has it has all the makings of a, of, a <laughs> of a fantastic um, epic story. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. And the other thing that I'm reading 
is a, a non-fiction book written by James Bridle, mm-hmm. uh, which is called New Dark Age, which is definitely a little bit nightmarish, but it's sort of covering a lot of recent advances in technology uh, and exploring how the world as we know it is is changing in the face of that and how it how it might be in the future. So it's yeah, it's incredibly interesting, but that's definitely going to take me a little while to to get through. But uh, a little bit of reality next to my complete fantasy is uh, is definitely a good it's a good balance. That looks like it. That would be even weight on the scales. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Not that we're into oppositions. Obviously. No, 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 not at all. Uh, so on that note, Alice Brown, thank you very much for your time on Art Fictions. Thank you very much. Thank you to Alice Brown and to all the artists who have inspired me to create this podcast in the first place. As I explained in my introduction to the series, Art Fictions came about partly because one of the most enjoyable aspects about my own studio practice and critical writing is the discussions I have with other artists. In fact, it was a conversation with Alice a couple of years ago which really cemented the idea of Art Fictions for me when I visited her studio and we talked about her paintings and, of all things, the excellent, challenging and perpetually relevant Dante's Inferno. A big thank you once again for listening to Art Fictions with me, Gillian Knight, bringing you stories of art and the art of stories. Connor Allen was the sound editor for today's main interview and Griffin Knight created the music. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, please review and feel welcome to get in touch with me directly via my Instagram, artfictions2020 or my website, gilliannipe.co.uk. Happy reading and art viewing until next time.